Let say what you apologize for. Yeah. 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 we already had to submit it, so it's, oh, uh, it's, it's okay. okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I don't pay. You figure it out. Okay. Well, is that right? right? There you go. I said, no problem for a long time. What happened? Just got paid. Just got paid. All right, we'll go ahead and get started as a few more uh, starters uh, come in. Uh, so I'm Doug Brake, uh, uh, telecom policy analyst here at the Information Technology Innovation Foundation. Uh, thank you all so much for uh, joining us this morning on uh, the eve of a very important uh, vote over at the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, I thought it might be nice to uh, imagine for you know, an hour and a half that we had solved that net neutrality problem. We could had some sort of bipartisan compromise and had had set that issue to bed uh, a while back, and we could focus on the real uh, telecommunications policy questions uh, that uh, that remain to be solved. Um, and so we thought we'd convene, you know, a panel of experts to, to focus on uh, what, to my mind, is a is a um, perhaps more interesting, more difficult, more uh, more complex uh, problem. Uh, I worry, though, uh, with, you know, on, the, on the issue of federal incentives uh, to more efficiently use uh, a spectrum, uh, it shares a, a few things in common with net neutrality. Uh, most of it is it's a perennial question, right? It's like we've been having these sorts of panels addressing these very questions uh, for quite some time. Uh, I thought it's an uh, interesting uh, uh, quotation uh, back from uh, Harry S. Truman in 1950. He wrote, the most pressing communications problem at this particular time, however, is the scarcity of radio frequency in relation to the steady growing demand. Certainly, things have not changed, uh, and one of the biggest opportunities, I think, uh, is uh, with government spectrum, right? Uh, by NTIA's own measure, um, about 18% of the, uh, at least what was historically thought of the most valuable uh, type of spectrum is exclusively used by federal operators and another 43% is predominantly used by, by federal government. And so finding ways to uh, more efficiently uh, ease the process by which bands are identified for potential commercial use and mechanisms to transfer that spectrum to the commercial sector for either license, unlicensed, or shared, uh, shared mechanisms uh, is, a, is a valuable opportunity uh, worth exploring. Um, of course, there are a wide variety of potential tools that have been discussed in this area. Uh, uh, spectrum use fees, uh, better defined tradable rights uh, for government agencies, uh, and giving the, you know, the agencies themselves uh, broader discretion in how their, their uh, spectrum is disposed. Uh, more extensive use of spectrum sharing mechanisms, such as databases. Uh, a more heavy-handed approach, such as bracketing the spectrum. Um, or a sort of like spectrum auditor. Of course, there are sort of hybrid approaches among all of these. Um, there are also existing tools in the toolkit, most specifically the Spectrum Relocation Fund, which saw recent improvements uh, as a part of uh, the 2015 Spectrum Pipeline Act. Uh, so I, I suppose there's this uh, continuing question of whether we want sort of incremental improvements over these existing tools, such as the Spectrum Relocation Fund, or perhaps something more dramatic. Uh, again, the perennial topic, lots of conversations about um, how best to move forward on these issues. Um, and so we've gathered uh, a panel of really uh, Spectrum All-Stars uh, here today to, to discuss this issue and try to drill down on really how do we identify uh, opportunity to upgrade legacy federal spectrum systems into something that's more efficient, more compact, and spectrum usage 
to be able to open up uh, uh, commercial use. So uh, I'll briefly run through introductions. We have much longer bios online, of course, and I'm sure uh, these folks are familiar with many of you in the room. Uh, first, of course, we have uh, Professor Tom Hainsley, uh, who is H.H. McAuley, is that, is that right? Oh, I'm McCauley, endowed uh, chair in economics at Clemson. Uh, and of course, Tom has recently uh, uh, published a wonderful book, uh, uh, The Political, Political Spectrum, uh, I've only just started myself, but you can, I can already tell, you know, it's a, uh, a wonderful survey of the history of spectrum policy and a lot of the public choice issues in allocating spectrum, uh, and Tom's wit just really comes off the page. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, next time we have Mary Brown, uh, who's Senior Director of Government Affairs at Cisco and has long been involved in, in many of these uh, spectrum policy discussions. Uh, very uh, thankful to have you here. Uh, and next to Mary, we have Julia McHenry, who's a chief economist at NCIA uh, and was formerly with uh, the Broward Group, uh, uh, accomplished economist focusing on, on spectrum issues. Uh, and then next we have Steve Sharkey, who's VP of Government Affairs at T-Mobile, where he leads the uh, technology and engineering policy. And then next we have John Lewis, who's the former deputy chief of the Wireless Bureau uh, and uh, a very accomplished uh, uh, spectrum manager at the at the FCC, uh, perhaps most well known for his work in the three to three dot five uh, gigahertz band. Uh, so, just a, a word on format. Um, this is just a classic uh, panel. Uh, I'll give each of the panelists uh, uh, some time to give their initial thoughts on the issue, uh, where they see opportunities uh, going forward. A moderated Q and A. Uh, and then, uh, and then we'll leave time for audience questions. So we'll be thinking about this as we as we go forward. So, Tom, uh, why don't you kick us off? Tell us a little bit uh, about uh, your book and, and your and your thoughts uh, for uh, uh, incentivizing more use of the federal spectrum going forward. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Doug. I appreciate uh, you and, and Rob and ITIF. Uh, having this panel and, and, and inviting me to be part of it. I, I was a little nervous when you uh, said uh, you had finished the book, but my wit was coming through. <laughs> I was waiting for you to say you were halfway through. <laughs> so I, I just I thought there was a punchline and it would be very, very, very sweet for that. Thank you. Um, and, uh, yeah, and quoting uh, President Truman, that doesn't go back nearly far enough. You know, I, uh, I, I like to look at Marconi and then Herbert Hoover. I mean, these are, these are the important people in spectrum policy. So uh, it, it is nice, actually, to have a historical uh, perspective. Um, and uh, uh, anyway, we uh, I, I do note that the book is for sale in the back. We're trying to make publishing great again. So um, uh, it also is there is a Kindle uh, edition you can get on Amazon. Uh, and the official publication date is next Tuesday. So. Get the book and have a cocktail. That, that's 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 the big day. Um, so, you know, not not just specifically for my book, but in, in thinking about federal spectrum, other other kinds of allocation issues in the space, uh, we've got two kinds of tragedies that are uh, absolutely all through uh, the history uh, of the sector. First is tragedy in the commons, and there's a very standard story about how tragedy of the commons in the early U.S. radio broadcasting market uh, virtually required that the government step in and have a central administrative allocation system. Uh, I don't use the term fake news, but I guess if I had to write it today, I'd use the term fake news. Um, th th there's a lot not to like about that story, and there's a lot to love in the actual story of what happens in the 1920s in the United States uh, from the standpoint of how uh, the initial rules uh, came in uh, very uh, very logical, very standard, enforced by the Department of Commerce, uh, right of first appropriation, or right of use, or many different names for this in the law, but uh, uh, first come, first serve. And there was a very um, uh, pronounced development of the industry prior to the 1927 Radio Act. What happens in the Radio Act is that there is essentially a coalition uh, of incumbent commercial radio broadcasters that gets together with policymakers like Herbert Hoover, Secretary of Commerce at the time, uh, to put together a, a fairly straightforward uh, recreation and distribution scheme that has been a problem ever since. I mean, it, it does uh, certainly clarify some, some issues. It did clarify some issues in the radio space and, and, uh, and granted de facto property rights that, that were of some value to, uh, to society, but at the same time, it uh, created barriers to entry uh, 
that we've been dealing with ever since, and, and uh, we're still uh, we're still there uh, here today as we talk. Now, there's a, a problem that comes up on the other side of this, and the, the lawyers have been big on this lately. Uh, I mean, in the last few years, the tragedy of the anti-commons. That's where you get endemic underutilization of a of a valuable resource uh, due to the way that rights are awarded, particularly with fragmentation, when you have a lot of uh, parties that should be complementing each other and cooperating, but you have uh, too many, uh, uh, too, too, too finely dispersed rights, you can get coordination issues, and you end up just burying the value of the resource. And, um, and, and so that's, that's a lot of what uh, we have to deal with. Uh, in fact, that's not fake news. Um, and in, in, indeed, I'll, I'll say this, the regulators uh, have come uh, to understand that problem pretty well in, in many contexts. And there have been very impressive uh, reforms. And so there is this interesting historical arc uh, to uh, radio regulation, if you will, over the last 100 years or so. And, and, and that is that uh, we do have burgeoning wireless ecosystems today in large measure because we have undertaken some liberalization uh, in, in some pretty innovative and, and smart ways that have, have really let the world work. Now, we still have a long way to go. Most of the radio spectrum today uh, really is set aside for uh, undervalued uses or no use at all, and we do have these endemic tragedies of the anti-commons. So, um, spectrum policy, as you know, is, is um, as um, contentious today as at any time. Um, a few, 10, 15 years ago, there was a lot of discussion about the end of scarcity in radio spectrum. Um, <laughs> so, um, the, uh, I'm very proud, I mean, in the, in the book, I do have a discussion that goes mostly back to George Gilder about 1994, who was a, a tech visionary saying, stop the auctions. Uh, that, that surprises some people that it came sort of from that uh, side of the political spectrum. But the, the, the little footnote of Jim uh, that I'm most proud of is that I found in, in Radio News 1941, the end of radio scarcity, that's with the uh, development of FM broadcasting, end of, end of scarcity, unlimited bandwidth. So uh, that wasn't true, and um, it, it still turns out today that more wireless capacity um, it is expensive, and uh, how we do it involves potential conflicts between um, uh, various parties. So economists are, uh, are famous for trivializing important uh, social coordination issues by assuming a can opener. And what happens in the radio spectrum with policy is that we assume an incumbent. And we start by saying there are these incumbents there, and we have to we have to work around them. In fact, just last week I, I heard something to follow up on the incentive auction, where I, I heard the, the standard take that the government had to set something up because you had all this um, you had you had all you had the TV ban and all these terrible transaction cost issues in the TV ban. Well, how did they get there? I mean, this was like. <laughs> This, this, this was all this was all part of the 1952 TV allocation table, um, if you will. So, if it's a regulatory issue, it's a rights creation issue. We often create rights in a way that it's very difficult to reconfigure the very valuable underlying resource radio spectrum. And so, when we come to some of these uh, problems today, whether it be the TV ban or anything else, certainly public uh, stuff that's allocated for public uh, assignments. Uh, fits the bill perfectly. We want to say, well, okay, there, there's some incumbent users. Let's assume that they stay there. How are we going to work around them? And um, of course, that's a very disruptive way to think about the problem. And that seems completely counter to the way we normally think about disruption. We think the disruption is to allow people to do something that the incumbents are not comfortable with. But the disruption is two-sided, and you know, it's, it's a fairly good point. Ronald Coase did get a Nobel Prize for you know, it. Um, he might have been overcompensated, but you know, it's a simple point. Uh, I, that's not my view. Some people have that view. But anyway, I think it's a good point. Um, if, if you're going to protect the incumbents, 
when the efficient solution is to figure out a way to get cooperation and gains from trade that involve the incumbents doing something different, whether it be upgrading their radios or getting out of that band and doing something else with their lives. Um, you're very disruptive to entry, innovation, to competition, and to social progress. So, yeah, that, that, that's a two-sided problem. It's not a matter of minimizing interference. Uh, it's a matter of maximizing the value of the wireless services that society enjoys. So, um, when we come to um, the, uh, you know, we, I'm, I'm very excited to actually to hear what some of the people at Ground Zero are doing uh, on, uh, you know, in the, in the public space. But um, uh, let me uh, jump. I know we want to go quickly. Um, in 1999, uh, there was a, an FCC spectrum on Bonk where um, I, I was one of the participants. And I argued that the bans allocated to uh, public agencies should have third-party audits that non-vested uh, security clearance cleared people uh, should come in and give objective information about the options, opportunity costs, alternative configurations for the public publicly assigned spectrum. And um, now there's a better idea. And Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel uh, has promoted hunting licenses for these bands. And I think it's very promising. When you think about the, basically the four problems you're dealing with, you've got multiple agencies, uh, generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking, you've got multiple agencies. You've got interagency conflict. Secondly, the property rights, the ownership of the gains from reconfiguring any existing use of spectrum is external to the agency. Uh, the gains from more efficient spectrum use, even the gains from better radio frequency uh, use uh, within the agency often are distributed widely to society. So that's an externalities problem. Very similarly, the property rights uh, to the gains uh, are, even if the agency captures some of them, the individual decision makers that actually make it happen fail uh, to capture uh, some, uh, or certainly most, of those gains. Uh, fourth, the negotiating agent, the outside agent that negotiates with the incumbent public sector users, let's call that the demand side, is under most situations now a government agency where you have the same externality problems in at least two dimensions. Uh, now there's a fifth implication here and that is that the constraints uh, are, are severe because of all these um, factors. It might even be a, a, a separate fifth factor, but you're, you're just not able to use institutions within the agency that are created in essence for solving the problem of how to upgrade radio spectrum use by incumbents and free up uh, the, the savings and, and, and bandwidth for other, other users. And those generally involve capital markets. Getting investors to come in, seeing what gains are possible, financing the deal, paying off the incumbents. Okay, the incumbents are sharing, and now they're being paid to share on the rational economic basis of the gains that will be produced by the cooperation. So the, the, that's a capital market uh, uh, contribution to society, if you will, of capital markets at their best, if you want to put it that way. But public agencies, in, in most cases, not allowed to access capital markets, and, and for obvious and good reasons. You don't want, you know, you, you, you don't want government agents playing the market, uh, that sort of thing. So, so there are all these constraints. Now, the overlay or hunting license approach that uh, I mentioned. Um, you know, focuses on creating uh, large and rational, not fragmented, uh, property rights um, that help to solve uh, really um, one big problem here, and that is on the negotiating agent side, you can get a residual claimant, sometimes called an owner, who, if, if it succeeds in getting a rational reconfiguration of a given band 
can capitalize on a lot of that and in fact use some of those capital savings that the, the, the capitalize gains to uh, to pay off uh, others who are, who are cooperating and helping so that innovation may actually help on some of these externality issues I think it does I think that there are good examples of this and I think that um, uh, AWS you know we've, we've had the, the PCS in the 90s was an overlay a lot of uh, microwave 4,400 microwave users were, were helped to transition to other things because in large measure they were being pressured and some in some ways compensated because you had new overlay owners coming in to provide um, uh, to, to provide some impetus to the transition you also had the same thing in AWS 3 maybe Steve will talk a little bit about that I don't know but um, excuse me AWS 1 10 years a decade ago uh, it, it's not a pure hunting license it's not a pure overlay uh, there were OMB and other government institutions involved in that but it worked it worked very impressively in terms of speeding up the transition to pretty amazing new stuff getting incumbents to do more efficient things to help make the transition work so it, it may be ironic to some of us uh, that the idea of the hunting license is to literally create a rent-seeking opportunity it could be auctioned the, the gains can be taken but by the by the Treasury, United States Treasury you know on behalf of the taxpayers but you're literally setting in place some incentives for responsible parties um, private firms if you will to bid and then gain the ownership over the product of their rent seeking okay it's productive socially useful rent seeking that we're trying to encourage the, the hunting license uh, can, uh, can be created and then distributed in ways that those incentives come into the market and we actually get uh, private firms pushing some of it even through lobbying to get society to move in the right direction to get radios upgraded or radio communications moved in a way that creates benefits greater than their costs so um, did I mention the book <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Mary. Uh, yeah, so Doug, Doug, you put me between two um, distinguished economists. And my comments are going to be like down at the operational ground zero level. So Cisco, as you know, is um, an internet equipment manufacturer. Uh, we, we build all kinds of networking equipment and we have a very strong interest in seeing um, both licensed and unlicensed spectrum be made available for commercial interest for the growth of, of networks. So, um, so that's our, our orientation. As a direct product matter, we care most about Wi-Fi or unlicensed spectrum. Um, and so I'm going to use my opening remarks to just tell you two stories about transitioning government spectrum to unlicensed use. One has a happy ending. One so far is very frustrating uh, with, with no ending in sight. Um, so first, the story with the happy ending, right? So in 2003, uh, the FCC and the U.S. government, uh, at the uh, urging of industry, um, take the position that significant blocks of spectrum in the 5 gigahertz band should be shared with the U.S. government radar interests in that band. Um, and uh, the FCC adopts a uh, report and order, and the U.S. government takes this position into the World Radio Conference, and it prevails, and this is a wonderful thing. Um, they, the, the group comes back from the World Radio Conference and we start a negotiation about exactly how unlicensed radios are going to really share with all these government radar systems. That negotiation <coughs> drags on for three years. So in 2006, we finally get from the FCC after all the negotiation is over and NTIA has blessed it and all the agencies have signed off on it, uh, permission to actually use the 5 gigahertz band um, using a mitigation technique called dynamic frequency selection, DFS, where if the unlicensed devices hear a pattern that sounds to them like a radar pattern, which we've been given, 
then they have to change channels. And uh, there's been ups and downs about that, but in general, it's worked pretty well, and, and it has been adjusted over the years. So that was a huge win, and it drove the adoption at the time of 802.11n, which, which was 40 megahertz wide channels, unheard of, you know, uh, uh, back in the day. But ultimately, it drove the adoption of 802.11ac, which is the current Wi-Fi technology that has 80 megahertz wide channels in it and only lives and exists in the 5 gigahertz band. 802.11ac does not exist in the 2.4 band, which would become increasingly crowded and difficult to use. So it only lives in the 5 gigahertz band. So huge win. Wi-Fi takes off like gangbusters. Right, as a result of this, right, this is an enormous win. And by 2020, um, Cisco is projecting that 53% of all IP traffic will be Wi-Fi. Think about that. Or, you know, we're we're going to start to see some LTE unlicensed flavors in there too. So let me just put that put that out there. But 53% of IP traffic is going to be running on unlicensed spectrum. That's the workhorse of the internet. That's how important that win was. Now the story that didn't that hasn't ended very well yet. Okay, by 2011, it's now clear that unlicensed is about to become a victim of its own success, right? And given the lead time to get new spectrum online, we go to Congress, and as part of the Middle Class Tax Relief Act, we get a provision that asks the FCC and the NTA to start looking at. Could there be other parts of the 5G band that we didn't get access to? Could that be made available for the unlicensed community? So specifically 5350 to 5470 and 5850 to 5925. So after several years of conversation in 2016, the Department of Defense concluded that there's no way they can share 5350 to 5470. So that was a huge disappointment for industry. It took a lot of time to get there. Um, but it's now clear that notch will never be made available for, uh, for unlicensed use. And as for 5850 to 5925, while well, there's still a proceeding at the FCC uh, trying to figure out, can unlicensed technology share that band with the incumbent ITS technologies? And if so, how? And there's a dispute about how. And so now we're five years into this story, and the final chapter has not been written. So I'm drawing from this some lessons. All of this, first of all, all of this took place without any kind of spectrum relocation fund help, because unlicensed has not been subject to the spectrum relocation fund at this point. So all this work that the government agencies had to do was not reimbursed by anybody, right? Um, and sharing is a difficult problem. I mean, there are difficult government systems that have to be studied and down to the very technical granular level to see the impact of adding these commercial transmitters in advance. SRF mechanisms might have helped um, and uh, might have helped the unlicensed community in both cases, either speed to decision or a happier result uh, in, in the second case. Um, the second thing is, it's very clear that we need technological solutions that both incumbents, government incumbents, and commercial interests agree work as a technology matter, and that the commercial interests believe work as a commercial matter. So we can't have sharing mechanisms that are so costly that any equipment you produce or the business model or the go-to-market model you have doesn't work your customers won't buy. The simpler the mitigation, the more likely you are to get to yes. <clears throat> Simple is always better. And time is money. Um, and that's what we've learned so far. So um, that concludes my remarks from Ground Zero on the unlicensed piece. And I look forward to Julia's thoughts. <laughs> well, um, rather than, than address those, because I'll admit, um, I'm not as familiar with those issues. I want to talk, take sort of back to where Tom was and think a little more theoretically about this. Um, but uh, talk more specifically about what NTIA is in fact doing in this area. Um, so in fact, NTIA has been working with the federal agencies to explore um, policies that might uncover additional opportunities to improve spectrum efficiency and federal spectrum usage. Um, and. You know, more specifically, the objective of this initiative is really um, 
to both help address the increasing federal demands on spectrum, as well as uh, potentially free up greater non-federal, free more spectrum for non-federal use uh, in the process to the extent we can. Um, so I should say that this is really in the early stages. We are we're really working from ground up on this. Um, but so what we're focused on is really policies that would help agencies meet their evolving and, in, and expanding uh, usage requirements within the limited bands of federal sharing um, or a federal spectrum and make some spectrum available for sharing. So we're considering, so we sort of have three parts to this. Um, as of now, we're really considering the options really across the board, uh, the list of options. We're really exploring everything that's been proposed to date and thinking about how, um, what are the challenges of actually in fact applying that to the federal agencies and making those incentives work. Um, so fairly early on in the process, we identified really as well at least two holes um, in the information and the tools available to the federal agencies that we thought we'd start to uh, dig in and try and fix. So one is we have actually partnered with NTIA's, NTIA's Institute of Telecommunication Sciences, ITIS, or ITS, to conduct research on how to define spectrum efficiency um, and in the federal agency context. And so the goal here is really to eventually, um, years, you know, this is obviously a multi-year project, but essentially develop efficiency metrics that the agencies could apply as tools to evaluate the, the spectrum efficiency of their networks and, and or their systems. And really the observation that, that drove this was the recognition that federal agencies are really not in a position um, to to be able to assess efficiency, spectrum efficiency from an economic concept, whereas Steve, that's probably what you guys do on a daily basis, right? So we're, since we're not really in a position to be doing that on the federal side, we need tools um, if we are, in fact, going to try to improve our efficiency. We need tools to evaluate it. So that's, a, that's sort of one key piece that we're working on. But um, actually, and I think Tom raised this point, which is uh, recognize that within federal agencies, um, really, we're, we don't have a good handle on who is making the spectrum dependent decisions, right? And so often that's outside of the spectrum managers within the agencies, and it may be um, higher up and somewhere buried in procurement in other places. So we're doing some research around this to look at how agencies make decisions regarding spectrum usage, um, really starting from the earliest stages of defining the mission and system requirements through operational deployment. So this recognizes that in some cases, decisions impacting spectrum use are not made by the spectrum managers. Um, and in order to make incentives, any incentive effective, we need to make sure that we're actually targeting the right decision makers at the right stage of any sort of the life cycle of a spectrum dependent system. So those are two big initiatives that we're working on as we're also internally trying to evaluate the incentive proposals that are out there. Um, but so I actually, um, and again, maybe I'm agreeing with Tom on some of this stuff, um, but it, it is true that, <laughs> but it is true that uh, economists have this terrible habit of sort of assuming a generic agent like an incumbent uh, and then making, and then simplifying the problem really to an extent that frankly, does this no service when we actually start talking about implementing some of this stuff. So let me just highlight some of the challenges that I think we have on the federal agency side um, that will be important when we actually start thinking about what becomes implementable, right? Um, so the first is really, and I think this is probably the most obvious to everybody, but the budget process generally precludes agencies from being beneficiaries of the kinds of rewards contemplated by many proposals. And again, this gets to Tom's point that really we have, we have almost a twofold problem, right? Which is the agency can't be the you know, oftentimes the agency can't be the beneficiary, and then also even if the agency can be the beneficiary, um, the agents within the agency, the individuals within the agencies that can help make more spectrum efficient decisions are likely not going to be the beneficiaries of any really any any progress made on that front. So we have a twofold problem there. Um, moreover, the budget and acquisition process really often involves a number of non-spectrum related decisions um, that 
preclude really even thinking about the effectiveness and the efficiency and effectiveness of systems. Um, so we need again to be to have incentives that are influencing the right people at the right time, recognizing that the, the real pressures within the agencies are um, budget and timing, right? And, and so that's an important piece. Another constraint really um, is that, frankly, and this is one of Dorothy Robine's big points, so I'll give her the credit, um, but the budget process typically just can't, well, has to account for the full value of the capital investment in one year. So that makes it, in many cases, very difficult for an existing system to make the efficient investments um, because we just can't afford to do it. And related to that is, particularly you know, when we think of DoD systems, we're thinking of spectrum being an essential but very small component of an extraordinarily much larger program. So we think about upgrading the spectrum efficiency of that program, um, that's going to have a lot of, sort of indirect effects that we have to think about, and they frankly are very costly. So I think these are all really constraints that we are um, need to think a little more about. I should also say, uh, you know, stepping back to sort of more the federal agency at large process, obviously the operating requirements of federal agencies are often markedly different from the commercial sector. So that we really, if we want to think about sharing, um, we need to think about how, how to do that piece work, right? So in many cases, we don't have a single agency typically controlling the entire spectrum band, which both makes sharing and coordinating and even purposing a much bigger challenge. So, um, with that, I will. Thank you, Steve. Thanks. Um, so, I'll just talk a little bit about some of our experience. I, you know, for T-Mobile, we've done we've been pretty involved in spectrum issues in general and reallocating spectrum. And frankly, it's an inherently contentious process, and you're always looking at spectrum that's got an incumbent in it. Um, often, it's federal agencies that. Uh, are risk adverse and um, have a, you know a big organization that has got lots of different parts, and you know you're often working with one part uh, uh, that may see benefits when another part doesn't, and you kind of hit these brick walls at, at different times in the process. But I, I actually, are you, are you talking about a telephone company? <laughs> <laughs> Telephone companies, right, yeah. um, uh, you know, but I do think we've actually made a lot of progress in you know working through um, a reallocation process and making it um, more cooperative. And I think we've, we've actually, especially for DOD, we've seen um, uh, a mind shift at least in the spectrum management level of their willingness to sit down and cooperate and look at options. Um, and frankly, like the Spectrum Relocation Fund has been a big part of that. And I think we need to make sure that that works uh, better for the agencies and is more responsive to their needs. But, you know, going back to the AWS-1 um, uh, process that was mentioned, uh, you know, that was moving um, federal users out of, uh, uh, out of Spectrum and really first application on the Spectrum Relocation Fund. And there we found, you know, while there was money to replace radios, replace systems, it was being very narrowly interpreted by um, IOMB on you need to replace and get no additional capabilities. It's, uh, you know, a radio with the exact same capability. So we were faced with a, with a problem where federal agencies that were using analog radios that were vastly out of date um, wanted to buy digital radios without any real new capabilities, but just a more modern technology, which makes perfect sense, but weren't allowed to do that because of the limitations and the rules and the interpretations. And they didn't have the analog radios on the market anymore, did right. they, right? So the analog radios no longer existed. It would be much more expensive to go back and have somebody build, you know, rebuild analog radios. Um, you know, from our perspective, it's like, it's not that much money. We'll pay for new radios for this band, even outside of this. And there's no provision for allowing a private sector company to do that. Uh, and so it became a pretty burdensome process, not necessarily because of the federal agencies and their unwillingness to move forward, but just the overall um, kind of government structure around that. There's been a lot of 
of good changes to the SRF structure since then, and agencies can get uh, more modern equipment, can get some new capabilities, it promotes uh, sharing. Uh, there's been money that's uh, made available to do research um, so that it, uh, that can advance technology for an agency. Uh, again, I think there are challenges in, in that process, uh, and we need to make it probably a more fluid process for agencies. You know, one of the systems, um, uh, we're going through the reallocation of the AWS 3 spectrum right now. One of the major dumb impediments in that band are air, air combat training systems, which are airborne systems that uh, preclude um, uses over very large areas since, since they are airborne. Um, it's an old system. And, you know, when we went through a process talking to the federal agencies, looking at those, um, the people that ran that system said it's 30 years old. They knew it was inefficient. They would love to have it replaced. Uh, but, and, and I, hopefully we get there, but I think there's still, you know, challenges in kind of doing that as efficiently, um, uh, as we probably need to and as fluidly as, as we need to, to make things like that happen. Um, you know, but overall, I think there has been good progress. It's still, you know, there are just some realistic challenges in dealing with federal agencies and federal process and procurement process. Um, we, there do have to be some reasonable checks and balances on how the money is spent um, and allocated. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I, I do think it's working better and we see better cooperation from federal agencies and, um, in talking to us and working with us. Uh, but still, you know, there's still some, uh, some improvements and incremental improvements that, that can be made there. So maybe I'll just end there with you know, back and forth. Uh, John, kick it down to you. Uh, 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 so, no, um, I should just stipulate up front that I'm only talking on behalf of myself, not the MCC or any current or future uh, employment. Okay. Uh, can you talk on behalf of the FCC now? You're not yeah, there. Exactly. Yeah, I'll tell you exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, my role at the FCC for uh, almost seven years was essentially trying to help uh, solve some of these problems. Um, and uh, it was an eye-opening educational experience for me to go through. It was a big, it was a journey. Uh, we managed to uh, bring to market over 300 megahertz of uh, licensed spectrum. Um, uh, various stages of implementation right now, um, which is starting from zero, which I think is pretty proud of that. Um, and I, you know, I participated in some of these interagency groups, the policy plan steering group, which one out of NCIA, and some others that, um, and some White House-led uh, discussions that uh, the DWS3, for example, 3.5 gigahertz and so forth. So I guess I will, you know, share my viewpoint based on that experience. Um, and also as a fairly theoretical, philosophical person, so it was, Really draw on the kinds of ideas that uh, um, people have talked about. Um, so somewhere in the middle, I think, is where maybe uh, the path is. Um, I think that um, uh, just to start, kind of, you know, at the here and now. I think there are, uh, you know, over time, uh, as we've tried to kind of work our way through some of these problems repetitively, especially in the license spectrum area, there are now there's a toolbox of tools available uh, to be used to help us solve some of these problems. And at least in the, specific, in the case of specific bands and specific instances that might lead to an auction, it's an open question whether or not there might be amendments to the CSEA at some point that would allow for sort of an unlicensed fund. Um, I think that raises controversy about how you would fund that and how you would collect the revenue for that from the unlicensed uh, device uh, market. I'll just put, put that aside. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, the SRF started off kind of narrowly as a relocation fund. It's very backward looking. The idea was kind of to make people whole um, based on systems that um, were being disrupted by spectrum auctions. Um, and the idea was, you know, you can auction off spectrum, you can use the, the money to go to the SRF, and then the agencies come up with what's called a transition plan, and 110% of that transition plan uh, can be funded to pay for uh, the agencies to essentially move out of the band kind of retune their systems, et cetera, and that's what happened in AWS 1, and it's, what happened with AWS 3 is that concept was expanded a little bit to include um, not just pure, you know, equivalent systems, but also the idea that some systems can actually upgrade a little bit, if that helps them get out of the band, some of them can um, share uh, permanently, or, or not just um, 
uh, I think more temporarily as during a transition period to a facility transition. So I think that's that's been you know was a, kind of a key aspect of the success data history option. Um, there was an amendment passed in a budget law a few years ago um, that many of us supported, which um, allows the SRF money to be utilized not just for backward looking or kind of instantaneous you know spectrum uh, instant spectrum um, uh, relocation purposes, but also forward looking for research and development to come up with um, new systems and platforms that can be over the long term more efficient for federal agencies. So, kind of the poster child example of this that's out there right now is there's a um, a system uh, concept called Sensor, which I forgot what it stands for, but it's being run out of the FAA. This was an FAA idea, and I think you know people don't normally think of FAA as the sort of bastion of you know forward link thinking spectrum policy. But this was definitely came out of you know this was their spectrum team coming to the table with some really interesting ideas. And their idea was they have there's some valuable spectrum in the L band that they use for for radars and. Um, along with some other agencies for certain missions, and they realized that they could actually potentially consolidate multiple missions from multiple agencies on a single radar platform in a higher frequency band using less spectrum. Um, if only, you know, it can be proved out that that system can actually meet the mission requirements. That's not a trivial thing when you're talking about really important government missions. So um, I think it is quite possible, hopefully likely, that some of this SRF money will be devoted to uh, some proof of concept pilot testing of that system uh, that would very build confidence um, uh, among the uh, different radar using federal agencies that would share the ultimate new system um, and potentially create a double bottom line, which is more spectrum gets auctioned, a triple bottom line, more spectrum gets auctioned for the uh, for the uh, mobile industry and mobile and, and consumers to use. Um, Treasury would benefit from an auction and um, Revenue from the auction would be used to fund a sort of brand new system that that, that, that could be, um, you know, an upgrade in terms of capability and technology for several agencies. I think this is an extremely complex project, so I don't want to say that it's destined to succeed. But I think it's you know, we have the, it's just an example of where we have tools that are in the toolbox, and I think we we ought to push ourselves as a community to think about how to use them. Um, Steve mentioned the air ground acts, well, air, air, airborne, airborne acts. I mean, one of the big learnings from AWS 3 for me was many of these incumbent systems that are occupying some of the most valuable frequencies uh, in the federal side are airborne. And, you know, airborne systems intrinsically, like Steve said, cast a wider, conclusive spectrum. You know, they have a bigger footprint because you've got high above the cutter, you've got, um, you know, fast moving airplanes that are very mobile, et cetera, et cetera, the ultimate mobile device. And, um, and you know, so it's worth asking the question. You know, we've got several different airborne platforms and several different bands that perform essentially, you know, different missions based on different um, types of um, you know data transport. You've got air combat training, which is kind of like the Top Gun simulation thing from the uh, actually predates Top Gun, um, supports the system. Um, and you've got um, a aeronautical telemetry, which is used to stream data down uh, uh, for. Um, Flight testing and so many of these test and training systems. Um, question: I think it's an interesting question. Could you come up with a sensor-like platform that essentially is an air-to-ground, almost a you know a national air air-to-ground network for federal mission space that would you know use less spectrum but provide more mission capability? And could you use could you test develop that using the SRF and then ultimately fund it with an auction? Those are the kind of big win projects I think that um, actually you know have real you know solve some of the double agency problems that. Uh, Julia and Tom were talking about because the mission guys on the ground as well as the higher ups and these agencies see benefits from that, but they have to be convinced that it will work and actually improve their mission capability. So I could go on for hours about this stuff, I'll stop. But I just think, you know, it's worth thinking not just about the long run, how to make this sort of an autonomously running uh, incentive, and fully incentivized uh, system, but also just in the medium term, short to medium term, what are some um, specific projects that can create some, you know, essentially deals between the public and public private partners great real benefits thanks so much um so i neglected to mention earlier on uh we are using the hashtag itf wireless so any of those those of you who are watching the live stream if you'd like to uh, chime in with the question i'll try to try to watch for those uh but uh for now uh i'd like to dig in a little bit on this idea that, uh, that Tom first articulated as a, a hunting license. I think I've also heard this as a as sort of the spectrum bounty hunters idea, right? 
and sort of uh, 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 offering the ability to negotiate, try to get uh, you know either commercial users or, or potential new entrants to the band uh, in to uh, sort of dig into the nitty gritty details on the engineering, what opportunities there are to upgrade, um, and, per and perhaps actually provide financial incentive to uh, upgrade the system. So, so Tom, you identified some of the the challenges, uh, Julia, you identified, I feel like, a few more where uh, you have this problem of fragmentation. In some instances, many federal bands have several different users uh, dispersed geographically or in time. Uh, and we also have uh, uh, the problem of particular uh, decision makers perhaps not seeing uh, any you know, uh, benefits of, of, uh, of the SRF payment. Uh, or uh, financial incentives that we were otherwise talking about. So I'm, I'm curious to hear, uh, maybe if we could dig in on, on this question a little bit more deeply, and perhaps the, the good example, uh, John, that you brought up is this sensor program. And so I guess, I guess the, to my mind, the big question is, given these challenges, what is unique about the sensor program, which sounds to be like sort of what we want to be encouraging to happen more frequently. So what is unique about the sensor program that had the FAA sort of uh, move forward with this, uh, uh, despite the, the you know, potential challenges. Um, if anyone wants to dig in on that specific question or or that particular issue more broadly, um, Julia, maybe maybe your your thoughts on the sensor program? Um, yeah. So obviously, so recognizing that at this point I am on my own. So uh, so let me. I, you know, I, I think. A lot of things went right. I mean, so first of all, I, I would say that NTA really believes that the expansion to the Pipeline Act of the SRF um, was, was really one of the best, and you can argue whether it's technically a market-based incentive, but really um, one of the best tools we currently have in the toolbox uh, in terms of moving to more efficient and effective use of spectrum. So I think you know, that really, we see that as an enormous win. And I think, frankly, I think one of the biggest things that happened was we could make the money available um, to, to help support this idea, right? You know, I think that that's really number one piece is, I mean, look, federal agencies understand and they might, you know, they, they might question how valuable it really is, but they understand that there is a huge amount of value in this spectrum um, and they're not, they're not blind to that. So to the extent they can see an opportunity where they think they can improve their mission effectiveness um, at the same time that they uh, can free up some, some spectrum. I, I think they're they're willing to think about that. And so I think you know this was a wonderfully uh, entrepreneurial, innovative idea that came out of FAA, and it just the, the biggest the biggest piece was we had a great idea and we found a way to make it happen. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I think it's. I think if we if we can find the resources, you know, I do think federal agencies can start to think more innovatively. I think there's just right now there are so many constraints to that. Um, it feels like an uphill battle. I should say one other important thing about that was that they knew where they could go. Um, they knew they had the spectrum, and they have uh, some understanding of the availability of that spectrum in the future. I think it's. It's important to remember that really when we start talking about relocating federal agencies, many times we talk about you know, federal emissions are expanding and their demands on spectrum, you know, efficient, you know, they are increasingly trying to be efficient because their demands are increasing as well. Um, you know, the fact that there was spectrum available, that's a huge component of it, right? I mean, really ensuring that we have the spectrum available for federal agencies the future is a really important piece. Okay. I, think, I think that's exactly, I mean, I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we face here is that the agencies, it, 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 the biggest challenge is in kind of just getting discussion going with the agencies because they feel like, you know, once uh, once the um, there's a focus on a particular band or system, that's going to happen, whether or not the, the solution for them is perfect. Like, they're going to be forced out. So I think there's a real reluctance to enter into any kind of discussion without some kind of a clearer path ahead. Um, and you know, so that's probably one of the biggest challenges that we face. And how do you have an open dialogue about technology or options without them feeling um, like they'll be forced out, regardless of whether those are 
Um, yeah, and I just want to say I agree with both of those comments. I don't know anything about the sensor program, but I have two kind of generic observations just from my experience on the unlicensed side. One is I don't think we've successfully thought about or cracked the problem of government system vendors and incentivizing them, number one, to be more efficient, and number two, to try to develop the kinds of platforms that Sensor represents, which is to address multiple agency needs. Right? Because every agency's got their own mission, they've got their own silo, they don't necessarily know what the other agency's mission is or requirements are. But there's really a you know small community of vendors for these big systems. We haven't incentivized them or found a way to incentivize them to think about this problem um, in a way that would lead to a replication of, of that. Um, and the other is, I don't think we've, this particular example aside, I don't know that we've actually cracked the nut on how to incentivize the different agencies to think about how they could work together, either in terms of um, moving operations into um, the same band or sharing systems or any of that. I think there's still uh, an issue that from historic operational modes, I have my system, I have my mission, I have my needs, this works, no one's going to yell at me if I keep this, um, and I am digging my heels in uh, and want to, uh, to keep control of my own, my own government system. We haven't figured out a way to break that down yet. So just two generic observations. Oh yeah, I, I just meant to, to two things, just one more thought on this, since it's a very, very practical thing. I think, you know, when we think about these kind of systems, I think increasingly, so I think there are probably a number of areas, of, you know, where you could have you know, shared mission space or common, you know, uh, technological needs in terms of transport or radar or whatever it is, you might have different missions, but they use similar kinds of technologies and could be consolidated. Um, one of the challenges, I think, to incentivize um, these kind of contracts that Mary's talking about is, you know, I think a lot of these contracts going forward ought to be considered to be as build and operate contracts and not, you know, it's hard, to, hard enough to get an agency to, to capitalize a, pro a program and then you know, make you know, commit to having operating funds. And now, now multiply that by four, and then they have to, you know, they have to make sure they have a, you know, interagency agreements and all these things. You know, all, I think one of the most just sort of practical ways to do that is to to let uh, contracts where you know, I don't know, Raytheon or someone comes and op builds and operates the sensor system and runs it for 25 years. One of the problems we ran into in AWS three is that OMB has a sort of an informal rule. I'm not sure if it's a formal rule where they don't like to um, use money from the spectrum of relocation fund um, that goes out more than 10 years. Um, they won't commit more than 10 years of funding. So um, if you know the solution to your, to your relocation problem is a 25-year system, you just run into a practical problem that, uh, of getting um, 25 years worth of funded, funding seconded by, uh, by OMB into some kind of side fund. And this goes into the arcana of federal budgeting, which I really don't understand. But I will say that, that you know, it's, it's a hindrance because um, you know you're essentially saying to these agencies, okay, well then you have to build and run it yourself, um, and that inherently is you know going to be a lot less efficient, especially when you have a shared platform like this. Uh, in much the same way, by the way, that the cellular carrier is more efficient than every one of us running our own little cellular network, except for in the case of 3.5, in which case every one of us should run. <laughs> um, the other, the other, uh, the other um, thing I would I would just say is you know I bring it back to Tom's points. You know I think it's worth asking the question. Well, could you have an overlay? You know, concept that would incentivize someone to come in and, and kind of essentially propose this kind of project, get the political stars aligned, you know, come to the table with funding. And I think you, you probably could. I mean, it's not a, it's not a, it, it, it's, you know, it's a, it's a decent idea. Um, the, uh, <laughs> I was going to say, the, 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 the only thing I, nice, <laughs> nice word compared to where I thought you were going. Uh, <laughs> the only thing I have with it is I think in a lot of these cases, and you know, markets work in funny ways, so maybe there's some counterintuitive ways that Tom will tell us in which this would all work out. But um, you know, a lot of these kinds of systems, you know, if you have a sole, you, you might be actually essentially auctioning the right to a sole source contract um, with with the, well, one or more federal agencies. And I would say, you know, as someone who participated in the back history of this, this is, was sort of part of the undoing of the old DBOC, uh, public, safe, public safety partnership concept, um, which was a government public-private partnership, similar kind of concept. 
um, to make them more efficient in their use of spectrum and, and wireless. Um, one of the reasons why FirstNet, I think, you know, succeeded, aside from having a lot of money from auctions, which helps, is that essentially it put um, a, it created an entity that's a common entity with representation of governance um, that let out an RFP process and allowed the public safety community to actually select the vendor um, themselves um, and have a, run a, a competitive process that on, on that side of the uh, the marketplace. And I think when you get to some of these big ticket mission critical government systems, at the end of the day, the government agencies want to be in control and want to be able to choose who their their supplier and vendor is. That's not to say you couldn't get to the same place with a monopsony buyer that comes in with an overlay, um, but it could introduce more uh, transaction costs, bilateral, bilateral negotiating problems, things like that. Um, and I just don't think we should ignore those when we when talk about the cost. You you admitted the irony in your uh, your initial comments, right? The uh, essentially inviting inviting rent seeking, but but please uh, explain this one. Yeah, no, there. Obviously, there are transaction costs. And my, you know, my, my my contribution is very small. After Ronald Coase uh, made this very clear that, and unfortunately for Coase, in fact, till his dying day, he thought his influence amongst economists was not large because they keep making making the same error that uh, it's just a symmetric problem. You've got transaction costs if you try to reorganize the market, you know, through through unregulated means. Unregulated being a bad word. But you, you get that idea, and then through regulation, you, you have transaction costs that way. So the, the real question is, you know, given all the, the costs, the markets, institutions, governments, uh, what's, what's, you know, what's the best result for society, highest output, um, how, how can you get there? So yeah, no, there's, 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 you know, you're boxed in, in all, you know, in all margins here, and, and so we, we want to see this uh, break out, and I, I just, uh, I, I do think that the, uh, I mean, certainly the, the equilibrium within the political system is to have agencies that take their mission seriously um, and, and and should take their mission seriously. Uh, I mean, that, you know, I mean, I, in, in the book, I try to make the point at more than one location that the, the regulators are generally doing their job, and certainly in, in the public sector with the use of radio spectrum, those folks are doing their job. And, you know, it's always mission critical to them. Their their incentives are important, and they're you know they're you know they're, they're just that's the way it is. So you've got to you've got to deal with that. Uh, and try to change the incentives with with rules that you think are going to produce a better output uh, for society. Um, and and there are some experiments that have been done on this that are thought to be failures that we can still learn something from. I think about unlicensed uh, PCS in the 1990s. You had licensed and unlicensed sitting next to each other. The license became very heavily used, of course, um, and um, uh, you know it's very nice spectrum. Right next to it was uh, 20, 30 megahertz, depending upon how you define it, of um, unlicensed PCS. Well, there wasn't one, was it, and there were incumbent users that had to be dealt with, and in some cases relocated to try to give unlicensed PCS a, a fair shot at using that radio spectrum. And there's uh, an organization was set up to uh, solve the fragmentation problem, and negotiating with the incumbents and, and working with them to coordinate. And it was called UTAM, and that stands for what, Michael Marcus? UTAM. I'm Marcus. Oh, well, if you can't remember, how, does, how do you expect me to remember? <laughs> <laughs> but, but I disagree with you if that was the problem. You just, well, you haven't heard what I said about the problem. <laughs> I know what you guys said. <laughs> so, so uh, it, 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 the, the problem was that there wasn't much use of that radio spectrum. In some cases, there were no devices. Uh, and part of it, there was not a single device that was approved for use. And there, there were incumbent problems. And, and the coordination was thought by many people not, not to be effective. Now, I kind of like the idea that, I mean, the intuition that the government saw that there might be the need. This, this organization said it took 10 or $20 per unit sold per device. I mean, like a licensing agreement in the unlicensed space for this organization to then take the funds and, and pay for relocation. I mean, it, there's a logic to it. So the fact that it's, it's I, I don't, I'm not telling you why it wasn't successful. You, you can tell us, but um, I think that, that we, you know, we, we should understand those kinds of examples. Uh, the, the last thing I'll just mention is I do, 
just on incentives within some of these organizations. I, I was, I had a flash, uh, I'm pretty sure it was 2004. I was out at a, a conference in Las Vegas of public safety folks. And this was the public safety radio, public safety radio. It's, it, wasn't, it wasn't that big an industry. I'd actually gone to the CTIA annual show. And that's just fabulous, you know. I mean, that's not just name one. You know what? Does it? Anyway, 2004 was great. There's, you know, you got the heavyweight uh, prize fighters that you know take a photo op, and you, you know, you've got all this free stuff. And, you know, supermodels at all these exhibits. And, you know, state of the art technology everywhere you look. You know, huge, thirty thousand, fifty. I don't know how many people. Then you go to this little thing in Vegas. They had it a big show. You know, one of these convention halls where it was just <laughs> crushed through the middle. It was very sad. And, um, of course, the answer is somebody said, look, when an agency wants to know, you know, how to upgrade their radios, what do they do? Oh, I have to call Motorola. You know, Motorola's busy. I'm just kidding about that. <laughs> <laughs> they call Raytheon. Anyway, so, you know, anyway, so we, anyway, what was set up was a debate about licensed and unlicensed. And we had Michael Calabrese and Peter Pitch and Jerry Fallhaber and me. I forgive, forgive me if I'm leaving out a, another part of this, but anyway, we had this very nice discussion. We say, well, you know, there's this consensus that we've been doing the spectrum allocation in a bad way. We need more bandwidth into the marketplace. And now the question is, how we liberalize? Do we, you know, unlicensed light? Well, how do we go about this? We have this debate. So somebody had the, had the nice idea to take a, a, a vote after the debate, you know, you know who's, who's convincing? So they say, you know, if you want more license spectrum, raise your hand. A couple of hands. <laughs> <laughs> if you want more unlicensed, a couple more hands go up. <laughs> so I'm sort of curious. And somebody, from <laughs> somebody else from the audience, how about just doing it the way we keep doing it? <laughs> the status quo one. <laughs> All these people are public safety, uh, sort of the radio guys. You know, it's a predominantly male audience. And these are the people at the agencies, you know, fire police, whatnot. They would call the radio guy. You know, go to one one little tiny sad conference once a year in Las Vegas, and and hear guys like us, you know, with this debate, they're waiting to go back to the table. And so at the end, you know, they it just occurred to them our consensus was not compelling. <laughs> they, they were fine with the way it was done. And, you know, you understand in, in that space that that's, you know, that's going to be the answer. So we do want to work on those margins and try to get the incentives, if you call it rent seeking, then that's what it is. Uh, you know, it could be what it is. But you want the incentives for that, you know, it might be better. You know, it's not that FAA people aren't smart and good natured and in fact can innovate. Uh, the question is, where does it go from here? How does it get out of the market? How do you do the, the, the complicated deals with all the parties, including um, uh, payments? And, um, you know, just to pick a name out of a hat, if Halliburton had the overlay right, <laughs> no, I won't say Trump Industries, uh, if Halliburton had the overlay right, won at auction, um, I might put my money on Halliburton, figuring it out uh, with their access to capital markets. Uh, and, and using all the technology that the FAA folks might give them. In fact, there might be some former FAA people that uh, get nice offices at Halliburton. And, you know, it may look like Red Sinking looks in other contexts, but if you do the rules right, it'll have a much better outcome. That's, that's I think, where I'm coming from. Thank you. Um, so before we turn to audience, uh, audience questions, I uh, wanted to really quickly try to bring this down, make it much more concrete, uh, and talk about really simple, straightforward policy recommendations. Uh, given that this is you know, not a panel of, uh, of uh, public safety radio guys, and perhaps we do not want to stick with the status quo. Uh, Steve used to be a public safety radio guy. Maybe you do want the status quo. Uh, so uh, within the uh, Mobile Now Act, there is a section that calls for a study on some of these issues. There also seems to be widespread agreement on perhaps looking at budgetary process and how these systems get uh, get budgeted within within OMB. Uh, but yes, very quickly, concrete recommendations, next steps on on how to improve this uh, this system, especially if we're looking at mobile now uh, potential for legislation. Anyone want to jump in? No concrete recommendation. No, I have I have one, but it's not in mobile now. <laughs> which is sometimes we ignore the simple operational incremental changes that 
make a huge difference in terms of sharing uh, spectrum with federal agencies. And again, from the experience of the unlicensed side, you know, we had, uh, we saw reluctance on the part of some of the radar community to change operationally what they did that would have made and could still make the bands uh, easier to share, um, such as chirping radar to make it easier for unlicensed devices to hear the radar, or things like when you start a radar up from maintenance mode, uh, maybe you make a few sweeps to give the uh, unlicensed transmitters an opportunity to hear um, to hear the uh, radar signals and, as opposed to just expecting the unlicensed devices to hop off the second the, the thing comes out of maintenance mode. So there's some, there's some real gains that we can make operationally and I think there should be a principle um, within the federal government that if you can make a non-harmful operational change that benefits sharing, those things should be made. Well, I'll take that on Mary's comment because I think it's, you know, it's a procurement issue and having talked to radar guys and all, they, I mean, these are, there are technologies, approaches that they can use that would make it much more um, uh, spec flexible and spectrum and easier to share that spectrum. But there, there's no requirement when they're building these systems. So you need to build something in the front end of the requirement process that makes it, you know, that gets it in at that level. Um, without that, they there's no incentive and in fact, the disincentive because there's you know, additional expense in, um, in, in adding those kinds of approaches. So that could be something that, you know, even if there is some additional expense, maybe it's, that can be picked up as part of an SRF kind of fund or a, or a research fund. Um, but it does have to be built into the front end of the process. Uh, and then, you know, the other thing, I, I don't know, I mean, there's a lot in the um, uh, in mobile now that I think helps facilitate um, payments or government agencies get payments. And uh, you know, I think they, from a practical standpoint, we just need to look at how it's implemented and that it's a process that works for um, uh, for the agencies themselves that are trying to move and look at new technologies and where there's a will uh, to do that, that that's um, facilitated as quickly as possible. Um, and that Frankly, with transparency, if there are ways that industry can help with that, um, you know, I think you find a lot of interest in that. Um, uh, you know, the agencies need to see some reward for what they're doing, and I think there is recognition now with programs like Sensor, um, with some of the DoD programs are looking at new technologies, and they've got kind of a, a big roadmap that they put out. Or, vision uh, they put out a while ago where they are looking more at um, you know, uh, kind of commercial technologies like LTE, how does that solve their problems better and how can they be more flexible uh, and so just looking at from a practical standpoint ways so we can promote that um, in the just agency process. Yes, John, um, just on this, on, on, so on the theme of kind of continuing to tweak and involve the SRF, uh, which is the main tool we have. Um, number one, this 10-year informal or formal limitation, which sure it is, maybe finding a little bit of way to address that. Um, uh, and second, maybe there's some way to work with the unlicensed community to address Mary's issue with some kind of voluntary or, you know, access to a ban if you or rather share the cost of clearing, you know, and imposes a device fee or something. People don't want to do that, don't have to, you know, I don't know, I don't know how it would work. That, that'd be controversial. Um, and uh, there would be actually just also increasing the R&D cap uh, in the SRF. I think it's basically capped at half a billion right now for forward-looking R&D. Um, and um, I, while well, I do think the money should be spent um, on focused projects that do Meet the statutory guidelines, actually requirements to create more spectrum that comes to market, um, and that's going to be an NCIA's job. Um, I think that you know, making more money about one fund, which is a kind of an evergreen fund, um, would potentially pay off in the long run. So I should say, um, first, NTIA has no formal comments on mobile now. In fact, it's just not our policy to comment on legislation. So I'm not going to go there. Um, but I do want to make uh, just 
some sort of comments in reference to what's been said to date. You know, I, I think, I, I, as I said in the beginning, we were we were working on quite a few of these issues, and we're really trying to understand and dig in deep. Um, obviously, if we are to implement anything or recommend anything, it has to be really implementable and viable. Um, so we're, we're really starting from ground zero on that. But I think that's you know, part of the um, Part of why we're looking at how agencies make decisions and working with ITS to think about efficiency is, is to think about some of this part. Is there a low hanging fruit in terms of you know, ways we can start to think about um, folding more efficient uses into the procurement process? But you know, and I think really thinking that far back is, is, a, is an important step in the right direction. Um, Procurement, obviously, particularly with the way the budgeting process is, once something's procured, you know, a, a lot of decisions have been made. Um, so we're working on that, and we're really thinking about that. And, and I agree with everything said here in terms of of sort of where the problems might lie. Um, you know, and frankly, again, as I had said before, NTIA really does believe that um, the expansion of the SRF is probably one of the best tools we currently have in our toolbox. And, and with respect to that, I think, you know, we, we do need to think about, we can attempt to implement some very fancy incentives mechanisms, right? Um, but at the end of the day, the question is, is simpler better in terms of, you know, we recognize it's a resource constraint. Um, it's ensuring that the agencies have the tools available to actually think about spectrum efficiency. And, you know, frankly, I think simplicity is good here. Um, so. Yeah. So uh, the you know one 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 thing that, that really I think could make a difference would be for the Federal Communications Commission to have a notice of inquiry uh, that would be very much like a request for proposals, uh, which is not uh, unusual for the for the NOI, but uh, and it would invite comments to the agency. Uh, with some specificity about which frequency spaces should be subjected to overlay uh, rights, uh, presumably by auction, uh, and bounties, in other words, public assignments uh, where you call it hunting license bounty um, overlays. Uh, so public and private uh, uses now with, with some of the problems of underutilization and um, uh, or wasted spaces, if you will, uh, need for upgrades. Uh, ask, ask the private sector for that information and, and bring in those comments where there are incentives already in place. This is, this is, I don't have to explain this to the FCC. This is, how they get, this is how they get all their information in terms of the regulatory process. All rulemakings are driven by, by you know, telling the world, this is what we're thinking about doing. Please tell us you know, what you think. And, and all the interested parties come come back with, you know, pretty strong arguments from their standpoint uh, that the regulators then get to choose among, and they, they get informed. By the way, a big product part of this would be to draw in not just the private sector uh, comments, but the public sector comments. So you could have experts at the NTIA weigh in if they, you know, on, on this kind of a thing. I think they might, and they might be quite useful. But I'm really thinking about the agencies themselves, the FAA. May actually have have you know just because we're talking about some of the innovations that they're uh, looking at and trying to you know configure for the world. Uh, some of those people know more about some of the institutional roadblocks uh, than any than than any of us, I, I would suspect. And you want to you want to structure the, uh, the the NOI so that you are drawing in agency interest, uh, so that some you know forward thinking. Um, uh, folks at the agencies would would tell the agent uh, would, would tell the the, the allocator uh, you know what to do. The, it, I'm not sure if NCIA would come in on the regulatory side of that or not. But um, so may, maybe I have that juxtaposition a little wrong, and maybe this should, should I actually all work through the NCIA. But uh, I'm thinking about the um, I'm not, anyway. I'm thinking about the, the, the structure to. Uh, you know, to ask public and private sectors to submit uh, specific plans for uh, new overlays. Can I just give a shout out to ITS too. I mean, Julie has mentioned a couple of times, and I think you know that that group. You know, we're talking about um, uh, economic incentives for for moves and things, but I mean, it is 
a pretty contentious process at the end of the day. I mean, I think no matter what, we'll be in situations where um, uh, there's a need to have oversight over what federal agencies are doing and somebody that can really understand um, the technology and what's happening and, uh, and question that. Uh, you know, ITS has been involved. They were very involved in the AWS 3 um, process, looking at what federal agencies were doing and, you know, frankly, an excellent resource in kind of being a neutral arbiter of what is going on with the federal agencies and, and claims that maybe the, the private sector are making. So, uh, you know, I think having them funded and supported is a great way in just moving the process forward in general. Uh, all right, so uh, any questions from the audience? I know we've got a number of uh, experts out there. Uh, Chris Marcus? Thank you. Um, is it most of what a, uh, it, is it most of what's in mobile now, particularly the first few sections, things that NCA and FCC could do today without new legislation? The five the budgetary things at the end of the bill are certainly things which are needed. But why aren't FCC and NCA doing the reallocations which they appear to have authority to do? And isn't it related to perhaps some structural problems in NCA going back to Title IX of the Current Communications Act? and its creation in 1978. Anyone want to take that? Uh, so I'll take it on. Um, I think right now the, uh, the focus of much of industry um, is on moving to 5G as fast as possible. I think the FCC has been paying a lot of attention to that with no meter wave. Um, I think there's uh, some additional actions that the current FCC commission is going to take to open up more spectrum, low, mid, and high uh, band spectrum. And uh, a lot of the energy right now is focused, on, is focused on that. I'm not saying mobile now isn't necessary or needed, um, uh, but, uh, but I think most of the energy from industry is in the higher bands. John, did you have a question? Yeah. How many engineers does it take to turn on microphone? <laughs> yeah. It's a smart microphone. It turns off when it comes near me. <laughs> um, a question for Julia. Uh, I, I love what you said about trying to build in efficiency measures and getting ITS to do that and build that into the system. I'm curious about the role of NTIA. Um, measuring efficiency, first of all, is really hard, right? In part, it's hard to, to for, when you have dissimilar systems. It is also very hard because it depends on what else is going on in the band, right? When we, when we put white space devices into the, into, into the TV band, I would argue that the efficiency of TV changed, even though the TV transmitter didn't. So this is all the way of saying NTIA thinks about the band, but you, you said you were advising the agencies who are thinking about their individual system. So is this is this a job for them to be thinking about efficiency, or is this a job for NTIA? So that's a very good question. Um, and you'll notice some of NTIA snickering in the corner. Um, so you're absolutely right that measuring efficiency, and, and frankly, even defining efficiency from a technical standpoint is a very complicated thing to do. Um, that's why we. That's why we're partnering with ITS. If, if anybody can do it, I think ITS can. And I think really to make sure the goal of what we're trying to do is clear. So again, I mean, I think we are taking to heart um, what's been written both with the ITU and I think some of the CSMAC reports and the TAC reports that have tried to accomplish this. That um, you need to start thinking system by system, right? So. We're not necessarily looking for a universal definition of spectrum efficiency. Um, but certainly what we want to be able to do is give the tools to the agencies that when they are considering new systems or considering upgrades to systems, they have an, a, a metrics to think about how to evaluate the efficiency, the relative evaluated efficiency of those systems. Um, and then also sort of from a stepping back a layer, um, thinking about efficiency, either in NTIA or OMB or, or sort of whoever it really is thinking about this. Um, but I, you know, so I think that's my way of saying 
it's not necessarily NTIA. Um, it's not necessarily NTIA's role, but what we're trying to do is um, give agencies the tools they need to make the best decisions they can. Uh, John, you, you look like you yeah, wanted to ask something. If, if I can give you a second question to tag yeah. on to the end of that, I've got a question from Twitter, and I think perhaps you'd be the best, uh, best to address it. Uh, uh, any sense so far of whether or not the Trump administration has a different take on sharing, spectrum sharing, than the Obama administration? Feel free to address that, Alice, <laughs> to, to whatever extent you have. No, I, don't don't think, I don't think we know yet. Um, I do think that. Um, you know, the sharing versus exclusivity uh, is some, to some extent a false dichotomy. I think all spectrum is shared at some level. And um, I think that there are, um, you know, AWS 3, which people think of as an exclusively licensed band, is effectively part and overlay shared bank. Um, um, 3.5, um, I think even people who were talking about, you know, potentially modifying that regime, they're all talking about sharing with the Navy. They're not saying the Navy should stop um, using the band as a non-start. Um, and I would further argue, you know, people who you know, real estate interests are involved, um, you know, having the ability to have um, you know, locally provisioned cellular networks that can be joined together in the cloud configuration with carrier networks or drive industrial IoT or something, that's very much, I think, consonant with the concept of private property that we have in the real property world. So I'm not sure that, you know, I think these labels get attached to some of these concepts um, and they have their virtues and vices, but I don't think they're, um, you know, dispositive. So I don't know, and that's a long way of saying I have no idea what's going to happen. Um, can I go back to the idea? You know, it's, it strikes me, yeah, some of these issues with, you know, trying to have an efficiency metric so forth that's been around for years. You know, when I walked into this building, I noticed that the building is LEED certified. Um, and, you know, there are other government or government programs, Energy Star, which maybe is rumored to be <laughs> being defunded, so maybe not the best <laughs> example. Um, but, um, you know, where essentially, you know, it's not so much about coming up with an efficiency, a number, as it is coming up with, you know, case specific best practices um, that form the basis for some kind of certification. And I think this to use point of Julia's point, that, you know, that might be something that would be interesting to explore in the context of federal uh, spectrum use, whether or not you know, there are certain kinds of practices in a radar system in terms of antenna orientation or you know, some of the things that um, I mentioned, um, that you know, if you do these three things, you become silver certified. And then, then you know, the appropriators and the, and the OMB types can use that as maybe a basis for um, providing some kind of um, incentives in, in the uh, appropriations process um, down the road. This might be. Yeah, I think we have time for one final question. Uh, Glenn Reynolds from NTIA. Um, this was going to be a question, but appreciate Steve's shout out to, for ITS. But going to some of the things that particularly Tom and Barry said, um, just having been involved this, in this stuff and these negotiations now for the last three years, it does seem that one of the you know, major potential for gains is by improving or, or reducing the transactional costs associated with these discussions between the industry and, and the agencies um, and going to the idea that any individual agency's main drive is making sure that their mission is not affected. So certainly there is a, every incentive for them to be risk averse. And it seems to me that a lot of time is spent arguing about basic technical scientific questions that underlie the, the sharing technologies particularly um, what are you know what are the appropriate propagation models um, what is harmful interference those types of, of questions that I think going back to Tom's point I think there really is a tragedy in the comments with respect to some of the investment in, in basic research that could improve those transactional costs improve the opportunity the time it takes to reach agreements or figure out that something doesn't work. I wanted to kind of figure your girls' brains as to whether you would agree with that concept and whether there are ways to address that problem. Uh, I absolutely agree with the concept. I don't have an idea right here about how to address it, but if I had a nickel for every hour that was spent trying to figure out how many Wi-Fi transmitters would be active in the United States of America, I could retire right now. <laughs> Yeah. So yes, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit there that we could, there's a lot of ground to be covered. 
that if it was solved and resolved, it would really shorten the conversations. And that's where we spend most of our time on the need of this three percent right? And looking at how their systems operate, how our systems operate, going back and forth on assumptions and um, you know, in fact going back and coming to agreement and then rolling back and going back to an agreement. Um, and if you know, and frankly again, I mean that's where I think ITS was actually very helpful at kind of being a neutral arbiter in there, but it's a, it creates a long process. Um, so I think we can do to improve that. Yeah, so it, it is striking over history the, the constant refrain by the FCC that they have to define harmful interference. We have to do it and we have to do a better job. And generation after generation, they don't. And there's a good reason that they don't. <laughs> uh, and let me just say to the side, all the information about conflicts uh, between radio uses, those are all inputs <clears throat> into the final efficiency judgments. Absolutely important. In fact, you know, good, reliable information is a very important input. But the efficiency question is not technical. The efficiency questions always revolve around opportunity costs and counterfactuals that the engineers can't observe. It, it depends on, on how you're coordinating, you know, these, these kinds of different economic activities. So, they're, they're, you know, that, that is a theme and, um, uh, you know, that's why, you know, being an economist perhaps it's just a, you know, a disability. But uh, I, do, I do look at it this as, as shifting those incentives in a way that, um, you know, really work. And so that's, that's you know, where, where I think we have to focus. I think with that, we're, uh, we're at time. So thank you all so much for, for joining us. And thanks so much to our panelists for uh, working with us. Okay. 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 Okay.